Hello folks, how are you? Good. Thank you so much um, for this invitation to visit your community and to talk to you about the things that are most important to me. Um, as an educator, you always worry if your students are gonna remember the things that you want them to. And if they're going to think back on the lessons in the classroom that animate the things that you devote your life to, and you're never quite sure. And I thank you for your work in that process of making sure our campuses are the kinds of places that can give our students something substantial, something to invest in and something to remember. And so I hope that what I do in the classroom aligns with the things that you want to see for higher ed so that our communities are not only sustainable, but they're inspirational. Um, today, I'm just gonna talk to you about some of the experiences I've had over the past two years since engaging in a national dialogue about not only the events in Ferguson, Missouri that happened a little over two years ago, but the experience of teaching inside the classroom and in different communities about some of the most pervasive and um, challenging questions of our day. One of the questions that I often get when I go to a community is about social movements, and particularly Black Lives Matter. And people ask me, are these social movements sustainable? Will they last? Will they be able to make an impact? And I think about that in terms of what we are doing in higher education. The struggle that we are engaged in today, can we find solutions and can we find ideas that will last? All right, I'm gonna use the clicker now. Yes. I'm gonna use that as a win for the day. Okay. Um, in moments of crisis, our nation often turns to one of our greatest thinkers and leaders, Martin Luther King. But one of the things I think is always important when we use the civil rights movement as a source of inspiration is to think about the lesser known moments. One year before Martin Luther King's death, he delivered a speech called Beyond Vietnam at the Riverside Church. And this speech really foreshadowed some of the deepest questions he was asking himself as he was looking at a nation that was coming apart around the issue of racial justice and building up um, its capacity for war abroad. He said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history. There is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in our passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistent or violent co-annihilation. We are at a moment where tomorrow is today. And when we look at our institutions of higher education, how do we sustain some of the values that are most important to us? And so today I'm going to leave us with some questions about how our institutions can ensure that the urgency we feel around us can be soothed and perhaps answered. So our first question is, how do we sustain our missions in the face of change? I work at Georgetown University. It was founded in 1789 by the Jesuit order of priests. And the question that I feel is always in front of me when I look on my campus and I see stained glass windows like this is that what did the founders of this institution have in mind in 1789? They certainly did not have me in mind. They did not have in we're being real right now. So they didn't have me in mind in terms of my capacity to be a learner or a scholar. They didn't have in mind the possibility that we could be at a moment where more and more people, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, could get a higher education. They did not have in mind the capacity for universities to not only train men, 
but to train many people to solve complicated problems in the world. And the reason why I return to the missions of our institutions is that our missions can sometimes really ground our greatest ideals, and then it does very little else for us. How do we continue to engage with this question of mission when we know the mission was limited by so many circumstances of the past? As a historian, I find this one of the greatest challenges of bringing my intellectual work to social justice. What was the meaning of the time, and how do I use that meaning to reinterpret our work? At Georgetown University, we have been engaged in a process that you might have read about in something called the New York Times. Um, there's nothing weirder than seeing something that you're working on in the New York Times, but I guess in a good way. Um, I guess it could end up badly for some people in the New York Times, but it was a good story. And the story centered around the decision of our university president to convene a working group on Georgetown's relationship to slavery. In a nutshell, we know that in 1838, the Jesuit leadership decided to sell 272 men, women, and children in order to reconcile some of the university's debt and in, and in a sense, secure the future of our institution. And in the process of reflecting about our ties to the institution of slavery, other universities were also grappling with what remained. How do we make sure that our devotion to the traditions of our institutions, whether they be grounded in its founding, in our athletics, in the things that are supposed to galvanize us as a community, how do we make sure that we're not falling into nostalgia? We have so many symbols on our college campuses today that remind us of this type of past. Whether it's Georgetown University's halls that were named for the leaders who initiated the sale of 272 people, whether it was the controversy at Yale University over stained glass windows that depicted slaves picking cotton, or John Calhoun, a fierce defender of the institution of slavery, or UT Austin's Confederate Memorial. How do we grapple with a history that is as complicated as the challenges we have today and understand that these choices can actually inform what we do in the future? When we started the working group on slavery, a number of people said, why do we want to delve into this past? What good is it to go into a time and a place where we can do nothing about it? But one of the things that happens when you are part of a process like that is that you realize that most of your work is about the 21st century and not the 19th century. That to explore our institutional ties to slavery, to Jim Crow, to the pervasive legacy of inequality and racism is to give yourself an opportunity to reimagine what a university can do. Over the course of the year of working on Georgetown University's relationship to slavery, something incredible happened to our campus. The tone shifted and the conversation got richer because for our students, the campus that they step foot on is the campus that they know. It's the tone that you set. And so when the university president says, we not only think about the history of slavery, but we think about the ways that our education can answer the call of remedying these problems, our students think that that's what a college does. It starts at the highest level and then it goes outward. And so students are coming to my office and they wanna talk about the complicated legacy of slavery. I've been teaching African-American history for over a decade. This never happens to me. Alumni, and we all know the power of our alums when they have an issue with what we're doing. Alumni wanting to spend time and ask about the work of the working group. What have we discovered? But I think that of all the different initiatives that we created as a result of the working group, whether it was the small grant program so that students can do creative projects around the history of slavery, whether it was a walking tour so people can memorialize the sites near our campus where the sale and exchange of human flesh was sanctioned, 
of all of those different things we did, the most powerful part of the experience was the opportunity to meet the descendants of the 272 slaves. On Sunday, I had brunch with 45 members of a descendant family. And they came from Phoenix and Las, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and Louisiana, and Maryland. And they came together as a family, and they came to our campus to see the records, the baptismal records, the recordings of the sale of their own family members, and to share with us as a Georgetown community where their family tree extended. As a historian, most of your work is captured in the past, captured in an archive on a slip of paper, on a lead through a library. But to meet people who are the living embodiment of the things you study is something that I hope we all have an opportunity to really experience. On our campuses, how do we see our institutions as providing an invitation to the public to come closer to the knowledge we produce and the outcomes of sharing that knowledge? This is a sustainable practice because these practices further the possibility of racial justice. Another question that has been put in front of me over the past two and a half years is our ability to respond to crisis in the world. And prior to August 2014, I think I was like a lot of faculty members who are really idealistic. Uh, my students are really earnest people. They have a level of energy that is, most times is frightening and maybe even a little irritating. They're so excited to change the world. We all have students, many of you in this room are students who are like this. The first day, you are ready to take something on. And you need us to keep up with your level of energy and enthusiasm. And so as an educator, I felt like I was doing my part. I taught about social movements. I was the cool professor you could talk about if you were going to do a protest and ask my opinion. I even joined Twitter, and I've recently joined Snapchat, which I think is probably the greatest accomplishment of my life, because there's nothing more difficult than figuring out how to post a snap. This is the greatest litmus test of age. But anyway, so I felt like I was doing my part to be part of the, the beautiful struggle of being a college student. But when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri in August of 2014, my life as an educator fundamentally changed because I no longer thought that my role was only confined to campus. I love that the theme of this meeting is beyond campus because what it fundamentally asks us to do is to imagine the real impact we have when we forget about the boundaries of the gates or the streets or the walls that close us into our campus. And so, like many Americans, I was watching cable news all day, looking at the images out of Ferguson, Missouri. Um, I actually went to the University of Missouri for college and spent many years afterward working in the state of Missouri, uh, teaching high school students, volunteering at my alma mater. And there's something about towns in the Midwest that if you live on either coast, you really maybe don't understand their geography and their feel. And so when I saw images of tear gas flooding a town like Ferguson, to see people struggling um, in front of uh, militarized police in a town like Ferguson, I was confounded. I didn't believe what I saw in front of me because that kind of chaos, that kind of turmoil is the thing that we often see on international news reports. For those of us who are um, old enough to remember the 1992 uprising after the beating of Rodney King. We remember those scenes and we think this is about big cities like Newark and Baltimore and Chicago. But in towns like Ferguson, we can't imagine that kind of struggle happening. And so as I'm watching these images, I'm getting ready for the first week of school. And I'm thinking to myself, all of the memories that I had associated with the first day, the first week of college. And I knew that for so many of my students, the tone was being set beyond campus, that our nation was in the middle of crisis and that they were coming to college for answers, for context, for, for a model of how you respond. And so I'm a big believer in um, doing what you're good at. 
working on things that actually make sense for your skill set. I'm not the world's greatest organizer. I'm not an attorney. I'm not the head of a major organization. My intervention in the crisis of Ferguson fundamentally was about teaching, something that I not only love, but something that I believe in. And so, um, strangely, there's a lot of professors on Twitter. Students are probably appalled by that idea, but a lot of us are on Twitter, and we share ideas. We share ideas about our work, we share ideas about teaching. And so I knew that if I went on Twitter and I simply asked my colleagues at other institutions to devote the first day of classes to Michael Brown, who was also looking forward to his first day of school, to the children of Ferguson who would not have a first day of school because of the unrest, and do something, anything, to have a conversation with your students about what was happening. This was not a matter of litigating right and wrong, of judging what was happening in Ferguson. Rather, this was creating a space in which thoughtful people talk about serious problems. Um, at many phases in my life, I'm up to something, and you can tell usually when I'm up to something. I was not up to anything. I really wanted to just make sure that my colleagues understood that we had a role to play and that our institutions could set the tone for a different way of thinking about a problem. And so I gathered a bunch of material under the hashtag Ferguson syllabus, and I had barely been on Twitter before. And when people talk about people following someone on Twitter, there's a little uneasy thought about having followers. It's kind of creepy. And then when I think of people who are really impactful on Twitter, it's Kim Kardashian, Justin Bieber, and the Pope. They have so many followers, right? Um, for professors my, like myself, it's a few thousand people who occasionally read what you say. But I was asking for people to intervene with the tools that we create on campus. And the response was amazing because a number of my colleagues said, I want to do this, but I don't know what to say. I don't know what to talk about. Does my discipline lend itself to this type of conversation? And for the first time, I was struck by just how much we silo conversations about race and justice to the sociology classes or to the history classes, to the African American studies classes. And I saw this as an invitation to share what was important to me in the classroom, to my colleagues across a wide spectrum. So chemistry professors were talking about the impact of tear gas on humans. Architecture professors were talking about urban planning and exurbs and, and public spaces. Fashion professors were talking about the way that people create identities as protesters, right? Music professors were talking about protest songs and freedom music. And together we had made a decision as a disparate community that at one moment we could do the same thing at the same time in the service of making sure our students knew that our campuses are always engaged in the work. The idea of an ivory tower is one of the most bizarre concepts in the world because we know the impact that we have when we decide to take on the problems beyond campus. Um, the other thing that was fascinating about Ferguson syllabus was that K through 12 teachers reached out to me. And they would say things like, my principal just sent out a memo. We are not allowed to talk about Ferguson. We're located in St. Louis County, and we are told we are not allowed to talk about this in school. What are we going to do? And I said, we can break the rules very creatively. So if we're not talking about Ferguson, we're going to talk about civics. We're going to talk about accountability. We're going to talk about social structure. And we're going to talk about housing. But at the end of the day, what Ferguson syllabus provided was a shorthand for understanding the tools that our campuses can provide the world. And then other people started doing this. And this is so exciting because something that wasn't supposed to be a thing became a thing. It became a language and an entryway for other academics to get excited about using our tools to respond. And so ever so often someone will send me something like Charleston syllabus, which was a response to the mass massacre at Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina and later was published into a book for people to understand the significance of the AME church to African Americans. The Black Lives Matter syllabus, the Baltimore syllabus, a way of organizing ourselves together in a space that moves beyond campus in the digital world. As we think about the way forward, we think about our ability to sustain our capacity to confront change. 
Um, for many of us of a certain age, um, campus today feels like Groundhog Day. We've been through this before. We've been through the student movements, whether it is the divestment in South Africa, whether it's for greener and more ethical investments on campus, whether it's the question of racial justice, we have been here before. And the question is, what did we fail to answer the first time? If you go online and you read the stories of places like my alma mater, the University of Missouri, or the campuses that I've worked at, like the University of Oklahoma or Brown University, and you look at the demands that students are making about racial justice, about the environment, about the reduction of sexism and misogyny on campus, and you Google 1968, and you look at the student platforms of that time, you would think that we haven't moved in nearly 50 years. What was unsustainable about our last round of institutional approaches to the question of justice? We can't answer the question that's on the table now without looking at the ways that we failed to answer it then. A lot of these movements are informed by some of the struggles around questions of police brutality and accountability in major cities. But I think something larger is happening in our culture today that we have to acknowledge. A lot of the movements today are informed by experiences of grief. And grief animates campaigns like Black Lives Matter, grief animates Say Her Name, and other struggles to remember the people who were lost in these spectacular acts of violence. And so in the face of so much grief, how do we sustain our passion for movements? How do we make sure that our students are not overwhelmed by a sense of loss and that every time there is a victory, there is also a failure? I think that there are some interesting models that we can look at of how we use our grief for action. Whether it's the mothers of the movement, women who lost sons and daughters to gun violence, or moments like this in Prairie View, Texas, where Sandra Bland was traveling to before she died um, in police custody, and the choice of her alma mater, Prairie View a and to remember her on their campus, we have to remember that people have an origin story, that communities are more than just their loss. And how can our campuses, places where students are moved by the passion and the grief and the sense of loss, how can we make sure that we enrich them and keep them healthy as they struggle? The conversations that are happening on college campuses today around wellness and mental, mental health and the whole person this is where we enter this dialogue about sustaining people for the long run. One of the things that I think is really interesting about um, my institution and other institutions' recent commitment to thinking about their relationship to slavery, that it wasn't just about the participation in the institution of slavery. It's about the ideas that were generated that supported the institution of slavery. If you read the fantastic book, Ebony and Ivory, by MIT's Craig Wilder, he talks about universities where students would bring slaves to campus and that slaves would build buildings. But he said one of the most powerful institutional legacies of that period were the ideas that were generated. People engaged in racialized science that promoted the idea that people were inferior and that some people deserved to be in bondage. And so as we think about the move forward and about the ideas that are generated on our campus, we elevate and celebrate these new institutional responses to thinking about the problem of race and its academic forms doesn't want me to get this message out. So we think about the different ways that our research, our ability to generate ideas can be in the service of actually helping the world heal. These new centers, these new spaces of interdisciplinary innovation, whether they focus on the question of environmental sustainability and resources, whether they 
focus on environmental racism or criminal justice. These are the places where the ideas that we generate will trickle down to policymakers and to community activists and to organizers in order to make sure that our ideas don't just um, exist for our own benefit, but they have the capacity to actually change people's lives. This is a sustainable racial practice on our campuses. It isn't just about responding to student demands, it's about creating an infrastructure of how we think about these demands. Um, one of the things that happens to me often is that I, um, I travel a lot and when I'm on planes, people ask you what you do for a living. And it usually goes like this. Um, I'm a, I say I'm an educator because I don't want to talk about it. And they say, well, where do you teach? And I say, I teach college. And then, whoosh, aren't college students the worst people ever? I get this question all the time, See, or a form of it, right? Um, they're entitled and isn't college just a big Ponzi scheme? It's just a bunch of money with a useless frame. And then I'm like, are you trying to be friends? We have another six hours on this plane together. You have made it awkward for no reason. Um, this is why I listen to a lot of podcasts on planes. So the question is, how do we make sure that people understand what we do and why we do it? And I think this often revolves around this question about financing and what are sustainable financial practices for our campuses. And so usually the story goes on the other end, when we sometimes talk to our colleagues about our students, we act like they're these terrible consumers. We look at data like this about student debt and we say, these kids are just consumers, they wanna take, take, take. But I think that there's a way that we have to understand the work we do as engaging not reckless consumers, but concerned investors. Our students are concerned investors. For those of us who bought houses before the crash, we can understand that. Our students want to know what is the return on this investment. That is a reasonable question. And when we answer that, what is the language that we use to explain what this investment does? Yes, some of it involves jobs, and yes, it involves the ability to pay back debts, but it also is about explaining to our communities that what we provide, what we do is a framework, a way of being in the world that once our students experience it at its highest and most principled way, that their capacity to change the world is endless. That what we do is we make people different so they can do better. And we cannot be afraid of that or embarrassed or ashamed because we see it happening every day. The masterminds behind some of the greatest innovations are some of our students. The way that they are able to organize disparate communities, the way that they're able to take the knowledge that they learn on our campuses and go out in communities, they invent stuff, they make apps, and they all want to do it in the service of the world. And that is something that, for me, makes me incredibly comfortable promoting this beautiful investment opportunity. And finally, this is the other part of the conversation I have on the plane with the grumpy person. Um, how do we sustain models of what we wish to see in the world? And that's inclusion, civility, and courage. One of the things that I think is fascinating, especially during a campaign season, is when people um, tell me about civil discourse. And they'll say, it goes something like this. I don't understand why there isn't more civil discourse. And how come campuses can't engage in civil discourse? And how come no one can argue nicely? And why is everyone so terrible? And often, I ask, well, where in the culture do we see it? Where have we modeled civility for our 18 to 22 or 18 to 30 year old, depending on the kind of campuses we serve, or 30 plus, where do we model to our students civility and civil discourse? Do you learn it at home on the holidays? Do you learn it by watching cable television? Or do you learn it in the places that, has the, that have the commitment to community? If we want more civility, we are the place where it can happen. Our students are watching us. They're watching our response to crisis and they're watching our response to each other. 
And so after spending the better part of two and a half years on the road, talking about racial justice, talking about difficult dialogues, visiting third grades and high schools and colleges, museums, organizations like this one. After spending all that time, what I've realized is that we are looking for things to be better and we have so few places that can do it. Our neighborhoods remain deeply segregated. Our churches remain deeply segregated. Our schools remain deeply segregated. Our internet consumption brings out the worst in people. We have an electoral process that is bringing out some of the worst in people. And so the question is, where is that sacred space? Where is that place where people can watch disagreement, where they can watch moral courage, where they can watch civility in the service of the world? Folks, it is us. We are the answer to the urgency of this moment. And I think that when we come together and we believe each other and we believe that our ability to actually do this work, there's nothing that we can't solve. So I thank you for your graciousness and sitting here so nicely and listening to me, but I thank you especially for your vision, for your sense of patience, for your sense of investment, for your desire to respond to the urgency with clear and careful thinking. What we have in front of us is a sustainable model of thinking about racial justice as we think about how our institutions can grow and serve more people. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. So I think we have time for questions and comments. Is that okay? That was a, is that all right, Julian? We had a conversation about questions and comments before, but I, I guess I talk kind of fast. Um, something I always remind people in these venues, a question is a desire for knowledge. A comment is a reflection of your feelings. Those are the difference. So questions or comments. And there's a microphone. Uh, hi, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your words and for being the keynote today. I was really looking forward to what you had to say. Um, I'm a senior environmental studies major at Goucher, at Goucher College, right outside of Baltimore. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is environmental justice issues. So the cross section of social justice and environmental issues, um, especially being, I'm like from Maryland, so living so close to Baltimore in issues of environmental justice. Um, I was curious of maybe major movements that you're aware of or any comments you have on engaging in environmental justice issues. Yeah, so I, tr I try not to, um, what they, what's the expression, you punch up your weight class, which I don't quite understand what that means, but I think it's about boxing. The point is, is that I like to, I like to kind of offer the things that I have. And one of the ways that I have found um, one of the things that I've seen with students, which I find really exciting, is the desire to think about environmental justice issues um, in its broadest sense so that students can come closer to this movement when they think about the Flint water crisis, a uh, highly racialized um, question of poverty and access in a town, right? And see that this is an environmental justice issue as much as um, environmental preservation, as much as questions about development and gentrification go into that umbrella. And so one of the things that I think is great is that as the environmental justice movement is constantly asked to think about a racial framework, its capacity to do work with more partners also grows. And that's exciting. And the way that the food security and food justice movement has also 
allowed us to think very broadly about what environmental justice looks like and who benefits from it when we think about that framework. So I think that's really exciting. And I know in Baltimore, there's some great food justice people that are also asking this question. Um, but I also think that um, one of the things that is always a challenge in working with communities broadly defined as disadvantaged or alienated from power is that we also have to always keep in mind that the way that we imagine solutions may not be the way the community imagines solutions. And where do we find that middle ground when we say we want to dismantle this huge system, but in the meantime, what do we have to offer? Um, I was on a panel recently about Black Lives Matter and criminal justice. And this idea that there are communities that want the total abolition of any criminal justice system, those are very few communities. They might represent a series of ideas, but in the, in the most critical moments, we have to respond to what communities feel like they need to be safe and secure. And as long as we continue that dialogue, I think environmental justice becomes a more attractive space in which racial justice can happen. I don't know where the microphone went. Hi, I first off wanted to thank you for your um, very empowering and powerful speech. Um, I'd like to ask how in conveying um, social justice um, and like Black Lives Matter and all of these really important topics, how do you convey that to, you said you spoke in, for third graders, how do you plant that seed? Because speaking with this audience, you know, we have, we're, we're older and we have the mental capacity to be able to wrap our minds around that and like, that's something that I'm very interested in is how to speak to young children about these really important things without, you know, um, putting too much pressure or like influencing them like in a negative way or scaring the hell out of them, you know? Yeah, so. and, I, and I think that's a really good question because sometimes we're grownups and we're scared and we're really confused. Um, I get this question often. Sometimes a reporter will, um, will interview me for like a story for whatever and then they'll say, okay, off the record, I have a five-year-old and I want to talk to them about these issues. You know, what do I do? And one of the things about Ferguson syllabus that I thought was really important was to provide age-appropriate climate-specific suggestions on talking about these issues with kids. Understanding that every community has a different standard of how you engage with young people, but it doesn't mean that you don't engage. So, you know, and then someone who's trying to troll me will say, well, will you, you know, show a second grader these horrible things on YouTube? And I was like, no, I wouldn't do that because I'm responsible. Who does that, right? But I think what you do talk it to a second grader about is what it's like when people are worried right? Because they, they see kids understand anxiety. So you say, you know, everyone's really stressed out right now because they're sad. Something bad happened and it makes you sad sometimes. Once you understand that there is a framework in which to bring children closer to actually what's happening, then you find yourself um, practiced in being honest with them. And so when I talk to third graders, um, a third grader might not understand the limits of the criminal justice system and accountability in a community. But you know what a third grader understands? Fair. Try to give one third grader two cookies and the other one one, and they will understand justice very quickly. And so you say, people are really upset right now because they think things aren't fair. So what is it like when you think, when you think things aren't fair? When was the time, what was the time when you felt like things weren't fair? Well, that's kind of what's going on with some grown-ups right now, and they're trying to figure out what the fairest thing to do is. Totally appropriate and acknowledges what is happening in front of them. And I think that that's where it becomes really dangerous when parents want to protect their children, but they, no one's a good enough actor to not surface the very real feelings these moments provide. And then the other side, sometimes people want nothing to do with what I'm talking about, which is fine. But one of the things that I hope we always remember and center in a lot of these difficult conversations is that I really do think that we are engaged in a national moment of grief and loss. And grief is one of the few things that all people, regardless of the resources they have available to them or their privileges, that they can understand. And so when I talk a lot about Black Lives Matter or what a lot of these struggles are about, I really try to center loss in it. People have experienced incredible losses, and we don't know what to do about that, but a lot of us can understand loss. Because at the end of the day, most if not all of us have people we love that when we say goodbye to them, we want them to come back to us. And when we keep that in mind, it takes down the temperature a little bit and we're able to actually really talk to each other.
again, I just want to thank you for being here. Um, and to continue off of that idea of people who just don't want to hear about it, how do you engage with people who feel because they are not a person of color or they have not experienced poverty or inner city struggle that that conversation doesn't apply to them, that it is outside of their realm of understanding and therefore they don't have to be engaged in a part of the solution? That's a great question. So one of the things that I think is really important for me as an educator is to talk about the dynamics of solidarity. And some of the best modeling of that is, um, for instance, in my civil rights class, I talk about the civil rights struggle in Spokane, Washington. And the students were like, the civil rights got struggle in Spokane, Washington, do tell. And I talk about a community that didn't have a critical mass of African Americans, but they had people who were severely concerned about the conditions that they saw around them and they saw it in the South and the ways that they immobilized solidarity. So I think what we need to do is we need to remind people of models, that there's a lot of ways that you can be in solidarity. But this idea that we all have, that some people have clean hands from these fundamental structural problems is one of the things that's hard to combat. And so one of the things that I try to do as an educator is not normalize the, the condition of not having problems. So if you live in a community where everyone has everything they need, that isn't just a coincidence. There are conditions that allow for that to happen. Um, sometimes students will say, well, I'm from a part of the country that's you know all white. And I say, well, that is not um, a coincidence that it has to get that way, right? And let's talk about how communities become one thing or mostly one thing. And so I think we always have to remind ourselves that there is a story um, that's embedded in it. And I think um, as a historian, I have the easiest tools to do that. But I think that when we focus on the origin stories, we resist that thinking of our... Um, that we're not involved or we're not complicit in systems of inequality. Thank you so much. And I also really want to recognize the AISHI staff. I'm a board member with AISHI, and I just didn't even realize the scale of the speakers you were going to be bringing in and that you've deepened the richness of our dialogue. And so I want to, as a sociologist, I want to also commend you for the content, but I really wanted to recognize you guys, and thank you. <laughs> So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so we started out with an incredible professor encouraging us to have courage and be public activists and use our science. And here you are leaving us with this message of civility as well as courage. So I want to ask you, how do you, and the question about how to handle the grief around this. Mm -hmm. As a sociologist, I struggle talking about, teaching about these topics and struggle also with the scale of sustainability issues with self-care. Yeah. How do you take care of yourself in the face of these topics? Um, I get this question a, a, a lot. I, I mean, you know, sometimes they ask you about like life-work balance, and I just think it's like such a setup for me to just, I, I don't have life-work balance in the sense that um, I work a lot, I do, and I really love work though. I really do. I love it so much. Um, I get a lot, I, I find joy in all of this. This is this moment of being here with all of you brings me so much joy because I now can imagine a community that is larger than the one I knew yesterday. I don't know how many people are in this room. I'm, I'm really bad. Thank you. No, I mean that. So I don't, I don't have that spatial reasoning skill where I can estimate the number of people in a room. Julian, how many people do you think are here? Six, oh, what's this name? Okay, so there's 1,600 of us in the room. About 10% of you can't stand anything I said, so then we'll kick that. And the other 10%, you're really exhausted, you drank too much coffee, and you had cookies during the break, and you're in some, you know, like insulin thing, and you haven't listened to me. So we've got a good, like, 1280, right? And among that 1280 are a lot of students. And 
I, I think that when you think about where you were developmentally as a student, I remember going to conferences and the speaker said one thing that really resonated with me and I felt less alone. And I feel the same way in front of audiences. Even if there was 10 of you, I'd feel less alone. So every time I go to one of these events, I said, whoa, I've got maybe 1,100 more people who are imagining the kind of world we all want to live in. And then um, next week I go to UCLA and there's like a gazillion people on that campus. And if 10 of them show up, that's 10 more. And that's where the joy comes from. The joy is knowing that we actually have a way to remedy the isolation we feel when we want to take on the big problems. And the other thing is, I really do believe at, that we all have like these little tiny chisels and we're all chiseling away at the edifice, right? So when I talk to my students about feminism, patriarchy is like super giant, right? But if we all have a tiny chisel and we're chiseling away at it and we're cracking at it, we're moving forward forward. And so I find great joy in this work. And I also have a personal life that revolves a lot of, a lot of silliness. There's a lot of like celebrity stories on Twitter. Now that I know that Snapchat has celebrity stories, I've engaged fully in that community. Um, I have a family life that um, really respects this work and enjoys the humor of it. I mean, it, it's a both and proposition, but I do think that we have to really attend to the fact that um, the grief is always with us. And so then we ask people to bring the joy. Also, I work on a college campus. College students are so fun. They say really funny things and they don't know if they're being funny because they're always remarking on how old you are and it's funny. Um, the other day I talked about who my cell phone provider was and the students just started laughing. I didn't even know if that was a thing, but they thought it was so funny. And so now I have more joy as a result of being made fun of. And so I think that, I, I, I will say this, uh, it's my last one about this incoherent response, but um, I do think that doing this work in a forward-facing way is important, but it is not for everyone. That the negative feedback I get, whether it's trolls on Twitter or people who send me hateful messages, um, you know, I think you have to have an infrastructure to really deal with that. And I think for a lot of young scholars who do really public facing work, we need mentorship and guidance on helping them deal with that. Because I think that part of the problem of the landscape we're living in is that when someone sends you a threat over Twitter, you don't know if this is a prank or a promise. And so the constant desire to chill our work or to intimidate us or humiliate us, we need, that's why we need our communities to take care of us. So there might be one person in public doing the speech, but there's a whole bunch of people that surround us to make sure that we can stay the people that we want to be. Okay, yeah, we should end at that. Thank you. Thank you so much.